Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Joanne Cannon. We were just talking about the room being so cold, we thought maybe this was going to be a panel about cryogenics and life preservation. Um, I am a policy reporter more than I am a science reporter. So this is going to be a panel where I hope I learn as much as you do, because much of it is new to me. A lot of what I write about, and a lot of what you probably read about, think about, or practice, is the discussion about multiple chronic diseases that we get as we age and how to better manage them. There's all this discussion about coordination and management. They want to get rid of them. <laughs> and the other thing we all talk about a lot is about personalized medicine, how everything is getting more individualized. They're also talking about the opposite of that, as you will hear, finding fairly simple or potentially simple interventions that will actually change the biology of aging, that will make aging a different process than what we have known for all of human history. Did I basically summarize our prep call in plain English for you? Okay. Let, let's get all get <laughs> while we're ahead. <laughs> um, and it's really, it's at, but there's some very complicated issues about when do you intervene and how many people intervene and how do you test these drugs over large populations. But I wanted to just start, first I will in fact introduce everybody because I almost forgot that, but I want them to talk a little about, I want the three scientists up here to talk very briefly um, for a non-scientific audience, just a, a quick introduction to what's going on in their labs and what their research is about, and then we will get the broader story. Uh, I have with me Dr. I think you're a MD, right? They didn't give me that. Um, um, Near Mar Barzilai, the professor of medicine and genetics and the director of the Institute for Aging, at, uh, Aging Research at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, which I believe is in the Bronx, right? Um, Howard. Um, then we have Christopher Height, who is the Vice Chairman of Global Health of Healthcare at City, who is not actually curing your aging. He is going to pay for it. Uh, <laughs> we'll pay and make money. Right. Joan Manick is the co-founder and chief medical officer at RestorBio. RestorBio is how you pronounce it. And finally, Howard Fillett, founding executive director and chief science officer of Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation. So let's just go down with the three. We'll skip Chris, and we'll just talk. Just give us, I don't want to call it the dummy version, but the non-science PhD version of what is exciting about what you're doing in your lab. Terrific. Fast. Terrific. <laughs> so first of all, I want to thank the Milken Institute. Look, Michael Milken had a dream and made it into a vision. He had nightmares too, but he had dreams. Okay. And uh, I think that's what happened to the aging field. We hoped that there is something we can do about it, and we know that we can do about, uh, something about it. We can target aging, we can delay aging, we can prevent aging and uh, reverse aging in several times, in, in several ways, and if we'll be good at doing that, we're going just to prevent all age-related disease at once. One of my projects of research has to do with the fact that when you have other disease, you have some phenotype, what I mean, if you have hypertension, you have high blood pressure. If you have cholesterol, you have high cholesterol. What do we do about aging? Well, what we do about aging, we're trying to understand why some people are sl slowly aging and why some people are rapidly aging. And the way for me to do that was to look at centenarians. And what's interesting in centenarians, those are 100 years old, what's interesting, it's not that they got sick when everybody got sick and now they live 30 years with diseases. In fact, their whole diseases appeared 30 years later, and they had huge amount of health spend, so their aging was slowed. But that's not the cool thing about them. The cool thing about them is they get, 70% of them get disease and die within months. 30% just don't wake up every day, but they have a contraction of morbidity. And actually, the CDC have showed that too, that people who are 100 years old, their medical cost is just 30% of those who die at age 70 and 80. So not only aging can be delayed in humans, but uh, there's a longevity dividend. And how do we extend health span is what we're trying to discuss today, I guess. Okay. John? So just to follow up on near, aging is the 
biggest risk factor for every chronic disease. And what we've been missing in the field of medicine is it's actually a modifiable risk factor. So there's just biology underlying why we age that we haven't been paying attention to. But in the basic science fields, this has really progressed. And they've identified the targets in biology that are explaining why we age. And we can actually target this biology with medicines and change how we age in a way that will keep us healthier longer. And this isn't any more science fiction, and it isn't snake oil. It's actually just real biology, medicine, and drug development. So at RestorBio, we've taken a biology, which is the activity of a protein complex called TORC1, that when you inhibit it in every species study to date, lifespan is extended and health span is extended. And we've broken this down and said, let's just start by making the function of one aging human organ system function better. That's the immune system. And by doing that, we're seeing if we can decrease respiratory tract infections, which are the fourth leading cause of hospitalization when you're 65 and older. So we're now in phase three trials, so this is actually getting translated to humans now, not in the future, but we are actually targeting this biology to de develop new medicines. Senility used to be thought of as a normal part of aging until about 1970 when it was discovered that old people who were senile actually had Alzheimer's disease. They had Alzheimer's pathology. And that was relatively recently. Um, about 40% of people at age 80 have Alzheimer's disease. Um, by the time you're 85 or 90, about 50% of people have Alzheimer's disease. Um, and so this is a common disease of old age. It's the leading cause of disability in old age um, throughout the world and the most expensive disease in our society. Um, just in the context of, of this panel, um, given those uh, figures, uh, and trying to bring drugs, like we said, for aging and how we could use them to cure disease. I think Alzheimer's is sort of the greatest example of what the impact of uh, using our understanding of the biology of aging to get towards treatments for disease. And so our foundation for the last 20 years has actually focused on understanding and translating what we, our knowledge about the biology into new therapeutics for Alzheimer's disease and inflammation, immune, immune changes with aging. Um, actually, some of the first papers I wrote as a scientist uh, and published back in around 1980 was, uh, since I trained as an immunologist, um, about the immune system in Alzheimer's disease. And today, um, you've heard a lot about amyloid and biogen and all these other failures. But as it turns out, about 75% of the drugs in development today for Alzheimer's disease are non-amyloid drugs. And most of them are around um, various pathways on the biology of aging, particularly inflammation. It turns out that inflammation, which is the hallmark of aging, is uh, one of the critical factors in the progression of Alzheimer's disease uh, clinically. So um, Alzheimer's, I think, provides a really great example of how we can apply principles of the biology of aging to the ultimate treatment of a disease, which is critically important with aging and, and the leading cause of disability and functional impairment in older people. How much, some of you are working with drugs that have been, well, you in particular with metformin, are, are, are drugs that are, that are already around, that are affordable, that have a good safety approval. Metformin, as most of you know, is available. It's a diabetes drug. It's the, usually the first line treatment for diabetes too, correct? That's the, yeah. um, it's not expensive. It's safe. Lots of people already take it. Um, and it, um, I don't want to oversell those, but it is being seen as a potential agent that'll deal with this larger issue of how we age. Can you want to talk a little bit about? Yeah. Without, about, with it, you know, yeah, we don't sure. know, not all of your answers are, you don't have all the answers you're looking for yet, but you're fairly excited right. about this. Right. I, I just want to mention there are young people who are nodding their head about metformin. And I'm, I'm really delighted that young people are, are worried about their aging, and we, we see it all over the place. I <laughs> didn't want to embarrass you. For 20 years, I have carried, <laughs> Nora knows this story, for 20 years, since the 1995 con White House Conference on Aging, because they have that every 10 years, and Nora ran one of them, I have been carrying around with me the envelope, because it was so hilarious, and from desk to desk to desk, it gets thumbtacked. It says, Joanne Kennan, 
aging reporter. <laughs> <laughs> we want to so stop that. When I was your age, they knew it already. <laughs> we want to stop that. So, so I want to explain something with uh, metformin. The fact that metformin in clinical studies or in association have been targeting many diseases we know. The reason we, and when we say we is a bunch of scientists, we got together and we said our major challenge is that aging is not a disease. Which means if aging is not a disease, the healthcare providers don't have to pay you to use this medication. If the healthcare providers don't pay you, the pharmaceuticals are not going to come and develop better drugs and combination drugs and really start making this impact. So metformin is only a tool for us with which we went to the FDA and say, let's discuss a trial. And we want at the end of the trial for you to have an outcome that is equal to aging. By the way, aging, we're against calling aging a, a disease because the ARP doesn't lie. You know, there's ageism and you called old people are being fired and are not hired. Now they call them sick and not everybody is sick, okay? But we uh, got in term with the FDA that we'll call it the prevention of a cluster of age-related diseases. And we agreed they on- They can make a much better acronym out of that. Right? Well, the target, <laughs> the, the study is called TAME, which is targeting aging with metformin. I actually want to taming aging with metformin, but it's targeting aging uh, with metformin. And, and this is really the goal of the study because once this happens, then everybody will jump, uh, all the pharmaceutical will jump in and will develop, develop mainstream targets for the biology of aging that will together have much bigger, better impact. Um, so about, I don't know, eight years ago, we funded a clinical trial of metformin for Alzheimer's disease. Um, and the, the rationale is that with the aging brain, there is insulin resistance both at the blood-brain barrier level and in neurons. And we know pretty definitely now that diabetes, for example, is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. Um, and so the way we designed the trial was to look at something as an outcome called fluorodeoxyglucose PET scanning. So this looks at how glucose is actually utilized in the brain. And you can get very definitive regional distributions of the glucose in your brain using this technology. And you can actually see glucose utilization in the hippocampus, the part of the brain where Alzheimer's disease started. And this was just an exploratory study to see if there was any effect. And in fact, uh, Jose Luxinger at Columbia University, who was the principal investigator on showed that metformin benefited patients uh, um, with, who were treated with metformin um, on their flux fluorodeoxyglucose PET scanning and showed some other interesting findings on cognition. They were very preliminary. It was a small study. But it's led to an NIH-funded very large grant that he recently got. And so right now there's a clinical trial of metformin for Alzheimer's disease going on. And I think it's a good example of, as you say, Nir, that um, while we want to look at the global effects of drugs like this on aging itself, we can also look at uh, organ-specific effects, for, in the, in the, for example, this in this context of the brain, and kind of bootstrap it with what you want to do to get indications and pro get proof of concept for these drugs in, in organ-specific diseases like Alzheimer's disease. So we kind of work in parallel um, to, to use the same mechanisms, the same biology to prove the value of our understanding of the biology of aging. Jenna, you're working on a new drug, correct? Not a, it's a, a new agent. So we want to tell a little bit about that research. Yes, so we're working on a inhibitor of this protein complex called TORC1. And TORC1 is the protein in your body that is activated when you eat to make proteins and lipids. And it's inhibited when you fast, and that upregulates protective pathways. And so the you know, intermittent feeding that a lot of people are doing, some of the benefits is because you're inhibiting the activity of this protein complex during the period of the day you're not eating. Our drug is unusual in, in its TORC1 um, pharmacokinetics because it inhibits TORC1 during part of the day and then lets the activity of TORC1 come back on. So it mimics time-restricted feeding, and we're finding that that works better than the approved drugs, which persistently inhibit TORC1 throughout the day. So it's an interesting way of sort of 
recapitulating biology that we have when we're young, and it actually turns out as we get older, we lose the ability to inhibit TORC1 when we fast. It stays on all the time, so we're sort of turning TORC1 back to its younger state with this particular drug. And, and I, if I may say, I think it's really interesting, and the foundation's been really interested in drugs like rapamycin, which is um, for Alzheimer's, but of course rapamycin wasn't the one that we could use because of side effects and other unknowns. So it illustrates how we can start with a sort of a chemical biology, right? right. We have a good molecule and then do chemistry and engineer out maybe the side effects and ultimately apply that. And we'd be very interested to work with you Absolutely. on your drugs to test them in yeah, Alzheimer's patients. Absolutely. Let me, let me bring Chris in, and then I, I want to talk a little bit about the difference between wealth span and lifespan. But Chris, when you hear this, the, your population for the, you know, when, I don't want to use the word magic bullet, but when the, the proper therapeutic is the entire world. Uh -huh. So um, there's also going to be a big difference if it's a drug that's already on the market that's been there for years that's off patent, in which case how do you, you know, Where's the mm -hmm. economic beef? Um, versus if it's a brand new drug, which is also raises a whole other set of costs. You know, what if we have an expensive new drug that everybody has to take maybe for decades? So, you know, as a your job is to make money for people. So, what is this conversation? <laughs> to be totally well, crude about it, right? to <laughs> and we, solve illnesses yeah, at the same yeah. time, humanitarian solving exactly. aging and, and so, some good return. So the, uh, the, the, th that's an interesting question. You know, there are uh, fish oils. Everybody's familiar with fish oils that are on the, you can go in any GNC store and, and buy that, and which is designed really to lower your, tr uh, your triglycerides. And that was originally developed by a company called, uh, well, Glaxo ultimately was marketing it. Uh, that drug became generic, and you can go into GNC and you can buy fish oil. And there's a new new drug that's been sort of a purified form of that that's now marketed by another by another company and being reimbursed. And it has certain advantages to the to the general sort of drug you can buy in the GNC store. So I think pharmaceutical companies um, are willing to em certainly embrace you know sort of like a generic metformin and and do things to advance the, the cause of human health. Um, the, you know, especially you look at all the consumer health companies. There's a lot of, you know, GSK still has a big consumer health portion of its company. Uh, Sanofi still has a big consumer health portion of its company. You know, Nestle, Procter Gamble, you see a lot of these companies that are very involved in human health through the non-pharmaceutical, non-RX way. So, if there's something there, you can bet that one of these big companies would get involved and develop it and ultimately commercialize it and, and certainly make a profit. But any market that large is um, a large market. Is a large market, even if you're selling it at a very sort of generic sort of RX price. You know, going back to what Howard was saying, I think. You know, I, uh, not working with Howard, but certainly uh, have been around Alzheimer's a lot uh, through various companies, Roche and Elan, and, you know, um, you know these, these disease states and, you know, the biology, it takes time. You have to run these experiments, and nothing's worked, really. We'll see if Biogen actually gets their drug approved, but it's, it's very difficult. Um, you know, I remember in the 90s, you know, gene therapy had just sort of become of age and people were inserting genes through vectors. And, and I remember a panel like this where all the CEOs of these gene therapy companies back in the 1990s, and the question was asked, when do you think the first gene therapy product will be on, on the marketplace? And they all said, by the year 2000. And then there was a patient death at, in, in Philadelphia, and I think everybody knows the story, but I, I think, I. I just caution that it takes time. You know, I, I would never bet against science, and you, I think the science will get there. But you, biology, understanding the biology, running the experiments, showing that it's safe, and getting a label, it just takes time. And we've seen that specifically around Alzheimer's. And really, even understanding the, Howard is an expert in this, and I'm not an expert, but even understanding the root cause of Alzheimer's 
I, I'm not sure we really still know. There, there is no root cause, I think, for any of the diseases of aging. Right. There's multiple causes, and that's why we're going to need to attack all these diseases, and including Alzheimer's disease, by multiple mechanisms incrementally. So we, the way we have to do it is, let's say we find out that metformin works, and maybe it works this much. Um, and then the next drug might be an anti-inflammatory, and maybe it works this much. And then the next trial is metformin plus an anti-inflammatory plus maybe an antibody against amyloid. And this is how cancer evolved. Cancer mm. therapy started out back in the 1940s with one drug, and now most cancer patients are on four or five drugs. Why are they on combination therapy? Because cancer evolves through multiple biological pathways. And by the way, cancer is a disease of aging. Mm -hmm. um, same thing with hypertension and diabetes. Most diabetics are on two or three drugs. Most Antihypertensives are on to it because we have to. The cell has ways of getting around these drugs and different pathways to these diseases. So we're we're attacking it. We're, you know, cancer research. I, I know the the Imperial Cancer Trust was founded in the UK in 1902. Senility went from being thought of as a normal part of aging to being recognized as a disease of old age in 1970 at a time when there were already many cancer trials going on. So we're, we're in a historical time lag, but we're, it's a very exciting time for what we're doing. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about metformin, and I think what was raised here is that um, there are drugs that are generic. But it's very important to, to try to test these drugs because we know their mechanisms of action and we know their safety profile. And through a process called repurposing, we can test these drugs in patients. And if they work, there are ways that we can create commercial interest through new intellectual property, through reformulation, through new chemistry, um, through data exclusivity, and other, other mechanisms. So you know, the testing of metformin for Alzheimer's, as an example, is not just a uh, academic exercise. It teaches us a lot about the disease, and it can lead to new therapeutics. And right now, we have 15 uh, drugs and clinical trials for, with, that are repurposing trials that are attacking these different mechanisms of aging, of the biology of aging for Alzheimer's disease. And um, we know the outcomes. I mean, through clinical trials, we've really learned how to do these trials. So we know the outcomes that we need to measure. We know their power and so on. And we can run very rigorous clinical trials now. The Biogen, Biogen recent Biogen studies are the best example of running really rigorous trials. That was a very successful trial in terms of how it was run, the fact that it could show target engagement, that there was a clinical effect of the drug on the outcome that was of interest, namely the amyloid removal in the brain. And it was the best test of the hypothesis we've ever had because um, we could actually reliably look at knowing the drug worked, did it have a clinical effect? And that's where it gets hard for, for Alzheimer's disease um, because of the variability in cognition. You, you want to say something and then I want to... I want to, I want to distance to myself from the last five minutes conversation here, okay? Because it went to specific diseases. Aging has its own hallmarks. We have eight or nine hallmarks of aging. They might change. The cool thing about that is that they are interactive. You don't have to target all of them in order to get an effect. Um, so... Why, why are we talking about aging as the cause of disease rather than specific diseases? I'll give you, I, I don't want to get into Alzheimer now, but I'll give you the example. We went with TAME to the National Cancer Institute, and we wanted them to, uh, to help fund us, which is a, a different issue. But, uh, and we showed them data that people on metformin have less of all cancers. And they laughed at us. They said, are you kidding? Every cancer is its own disease, okay? But what they really didn't understand that cancer is the major, aging is the major risk for cancer. It goes up and up at the age of 80. It's a 500-fold risk for cancer that is more than any cause of other cancer. And this is the point. It's the aging part. It's the aging part of our biology that promotes the cancer. What cancer you're going to have, it depends on a lot of things, your environment, your genes and stuff. Aging, you, you know, what disease you're going to get, we're agnostic. Aging is going to cause it. Whatever it is, if you're, you're obese and you have a diabetic mother, you'll get diabetes first. And if you have ApoE4, you'll get Alzheimer first. But even with Alzheimer, right, people with strong genetics of, of Alzheimer's, they usually don't get Alzheimer at age 60. Age 60 is still young for Alzheimer's. 
So it doesn't happen when you're born. It doesn't happen in the first decade or the second decade. It has to have 60 years. Why? Because there's a biology of aging. The biology of aging is what brings Alzheimer or any disease out. So that's how we look at things. We don't, we don't care what disease you want to take, we, we want to talk about. We want to talk about the underlying way to prevent it. John, yeah. Because so I, I was hearing two conversations. I was hearing this concept of changing the biology of aging, and I was hearing another conversation about we've been thinking about Alzheimer's as one cause when in fact we should think about a treatment more like the way we treat cancer with a cocktail or HIV with a cocktail. So those are, I think we're converging or maybe diverging. It doesn't matter. They're both interesting, <laughs> but now, Joan. <laughs> so I wanted to respond to Chris. I think this is a lot different than gene therapy. So what we're understanding about aging is it's like, for me, a car that needs a tune-up. And as we get older, some of our signaling pathways are getting out of whack and need to be retuned, and we haven't been looking at that. And so w this just requires small molecules, not like this whole new brand of therapy. Small molecules, and instead of being used the way they usually are, which is slamming them to like turn off pathways for cancer, it's just tuning them. And like for us, for the TORC1 inhibitors, just inhibiting during part of the day, a completely different way of using these small molecules. And I think this is, because it's not a new therapy, we have lots and lots of experience with a lot of these small molecules, some of which can be repurposed. I think it's a lot closer than gene therapy in terms of being able to get to humans, get approved, and you know not have massive numbers of unexpected safety issues. It's Sa adding same to our right. right, exactly. Yeah. So one of my questions is, um, in the 20th century, the human lifespan, in the, particularly in the richer countries, but even, and in poorer countries as well, changed huge, right? I mean, I forgot off the top of my, I looked it up and promptly forgot because I'm getting older. Um, <laughs> what life expectancy was in 2010 was, you know, 50 or 45, whatever it was. Um, and we're now, you have enough centenarians, centenarians to study in abundance. Is this conversation about living longer or is this conversation about living better? I, I talked to you on the phone so I know, but tell them. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I think as a geriatrician, I'll say that we want to compress morbidity. We want to square off the life curve. So, you know, we want the, the ultimate goal, regardless of life expectancy, would be uh, to, to enable people to live till they're 80 or 90 and, you know, have a bike accident and die suddenly. That's, you know, that's kind of the goal. Um, and, and, I mean, we... It, you just you, done you know, terrible things for the bike industry. Uh, no, <laughs> or die in the middle of it. But I, I think, you know, we've done this in adolescence, right? So the life expectancy curve in adolescence has been squared off because the leading cause of death in adolescence, where it used to be infections and so on, especially in, before the era of antibiotics, now is suicide and accidents. So people in adolescence live till the day they die, basically. Um, I think what Neil, what Neil has raised a little couple of minutes, we're on the same side, actually. Um, because but, but we, we were asked to be provocative, so, you know. <laughs> Well, you can be provocative, <laughs> but I think, I think we're on the same side because we're going to learn from each other, okay? We're going to learn from studies of Alzheimer's. Actually, actually, Alzheimer's is a disease of aging that starts when people are 30 or 40. Well, now with the brain scans that we have that our foundation helped to develop, we've been scanning people in their 30s and 40s and 50s, and we know that the disease itself starts very, really in midlife. Um, and so we can use Alzheimer's as, a, as an example of an aging disease and learn about the biology of aging from Alzheimer's at the same time that our field is learning tremendously from what you're doing in aging. That's why I want to repurpose metformin and learn what I can from you um, to, to treat people with Alzheimer's. Really, as you say, Nears, as a symptom or as a disease of old age that we want to attack um, and pr you know, get to the proof of concept. And, and that's where I think what, we, what we're doing has something in common. How do we figure out when to give these drugs to people? Because there are a lot of ethical issues in testing drugs that you're going to have to take for 30, 40, 50 years. Do you, how do we even know when to start? So and then I, how do we pay for it if we have to take them for 60 years? So f first of all, I want to say that the only thing I care of is health spin. Okay, the only care. And in fact, if there'll be those drugs that you develop, you know, I hope on the television advertisement will be, you know, you live healthier 
and in the side effect, you Good might life. live longer, we apologize, <laughs> okay? We don't know if you can afford it, okay? So, but health span is really something that we have to use because it's all about uh, extending health span. The TAME study is designed for people s between 65 and 80. And the reason, the main reason is that at that age, there's a lot of diseases and we want to catch all those diseases. As I said, I don't care which disease. For every disease that we delay, you get a point, okay? So, so that's the idea. So the question of when to start is really a complicated one and will have to be evolved. For example, you've invested in Unity, that is, you know, a senolytic company. Maybe Not invested. I'll we talk public. But yes. oh, oh, you <laughs> took public. Oh, okay. You should have. Uh, <laughs> Can't talk so, about specific stuff. So talks. this is... This is to kill senescent cells. Senescent cells are cells that accumulate when we are old, uh, but they actually are bad. When there too many are accumulated, they're bad. And in models, if you take those senescent cells, you, you, you get young again. So when do we have senescent cells? You young guys here, you don't have much senescent cells. You have senescent cells when you're 80 years old. So I think the senescence will be more of that kind of treatment. Metformin, a lot of our data for prevention of diabetes or cancer is middle-aged. So maybe you can take it at 50, but this is a thing we'll have to resolve. The, the mTOR is what's the age that you're uh, recruiting? Well, yeah, we start when people are 65, and we only treat for 16 weeks when they have their peak risk of getting sick from respiratory viruses, but we find our best efficacy is in people 85 and older. So there isn't, you're not too old to get retuned and have a better so function. yours isn't a chronic forever drug. Yours is a... It's a, yeah, it's, it, I mean... It's a couple of months. I mean, I think it goes back to your question of... But metformin would be a forever drug. Well, so I think that's the question, right? What, I, which sort of goes well, back to my forever, original... I forever, I mean, dec but decades. It goes back to the really the point, and maybe I, you know, I've been taught to be a skeptic of, of uh, looking at data and, and, and uh, companies surviving or not surviving uh, and raising capital or not raising capital based upon the outcomes of their studies. And that's why I sort of reference maybe gene therapy and maybe it's not the best example, but my, my point really is I think we have to run the studies. And right now, senescent cells, for instance, I think there's really incredible uh, early stage studies that have been published in Nature and, and all over around the potential impact of the senescent a pathway, for lack of a better word, that is really exciting. But do you and, take but that when you're 30, or you take that when you have a whole lot that, of that, cells? Well, well once again, 75. once again, you know, um, Unity specifically, who's going after the senescent sort of pathway with a with a drug, is studying it in uh, certain diseases of aging, like osteoarthritis or um, you know, ophthalmology types of diseases, right? So it's really pursuing a disease based upon... He says you're not supposed to do that. Well, I think, once again, it's very difficult, and it goes back to almost Alzheimer's, where getting a label for anti-aging, as opposed to you're, you're going and you're proving, you're running an experiment and generating data, perhaps, to solve a disease, right? And I think that's really what you're doing, effectively, in the sense of you're going after respiratory tract infections with a specific drug, that could be used across multiple diseases. And I think that's, it just takes time. It's, in my, my opinion, we're in the early innings of a lot of this stuff. Right. Before, before TAME, all of us, and I have my own biotech and I'm, I have a venture capital that I'm founder, we're, it's all about aging, but we're targeting disease that have an indication. Until TAME, that's what we're going to have. It holds us. Once we have TAME, we have a template to do it straight for aging. And, and economically, you know, if you have a drug that delays aging that you take all of your life, by the way, people take metformin all of their lives. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's a good economical plan here uh, for that. I think there's two issues where we need to be discussed. One is how we design the clinical trials, and the other is biomarkers. Um, you know, there's never really been a drug that I know of that came to market for primary prevention of disease or aging that wasn't first developed as a treatment. So for example, statins were developed for the treatment of people who had a first heart attack to prevent a second heart attack. 
Today, the data that statins are useful for preventing that first heart attack, especially in older people, is very controversial. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult to do these clinical trials of prevention. You know, imagine um, trying to prove that if you start taking metformin at age 30, it's going to reduce, it's going to prolong lifespan because you'd have to do that clinical trial for 50 years. Right. Okay, so, so it's clinical trial design is one thing, and that's why bringing these drugs to market through indications is much more practical as a proof of concept based on the biology of aging. Yeah. The second thing is biomarkers. Um, one way to expedite or ex accelerate the development of these drugs is through, through biomarkers. So for example, again, I mentioned the Biogen study. The, the success of the Biogen study was based on the biomarker, was based on the PET scan or the spinal tap that was able to measure the amyloid uh, and the effect of the drug on removing the amyloid. But we have biomarkers now for inflammation. We have biomarkers for misfolding of proteins. We have biomarkers in a whole variety of other areas. And so um, some of the design of these trials, for example, the FDA, and again, we go back and forth learning from each other. The FDA recently recognized a biomarker positive preclinical state of Alzheimer's disease. In other words, they would consider approval of a drug if it only moved a biomarker and was in a preclinical population who didn't quite have symptoms, where if you knew that biomarker positivity was going to result in the expression of the disease, they would allow you to bring that drug to market and, and then continue those studies to prove that it actually prevented the disease. So what we need in the terms of the biology of aging is we need biomarkers that we can say, well, if it's metformin, do we have to rely solely on the clinical outcome? If so, if it's a prevention study, is this going to last 50 years? Or what are the biomarkers near that you're going to look at when you give these people yeah. metformin that show that the drug is working so, on aging so processes? Let me update you. Yeah. <laughs> let me update yeah, you. Yeah, do that. And by the way, I have a, a in press a Nature Medicine uh, yes. paper on biomarkers for aging. So Good. first of all, you're absolutely right that biomarkers so just, like, show? Bi biomarkers <laughs> are, are crucial. Small minds and alive. we've done a, a major advance to do the biomarkers. And I just got a grant from the NIH for the TAME trial to do the biomarker So what are the part. biomarkers? I, I'll, I'll tell you later because it'll be boring. Okay, if I say MIC <laughs> or GDF 15 or, you know, but it's actually not one biomarker, it's methylation biomarkers and proteomic biomarkers. And there's probably metabolic uh, biomarkers, but they're with a significance of 10 to the minus 80. So they're, you know, it's coming to it and it's absolutely true. Instead of doing uh, uh, five year studies, if you can in few months see changes in the biomarkers, it's going to change a whole. But, but I want to say also something about TAME because the TAME is a study, you know, if you want a diabetes drug, okay, or what, what else did you say, a cholesterol drug, okay, you need about 12,000 people for a phase three trial. Mm -hmm. The TAME trial is 3,000 people and the template of that is really going to be very important because when you take people between 65 and 85, when you have more outcomes, you need less people, okay? Because it's not if they get diabetes. If they get diabetes and heart attack and Alzheimer and if they die, okay? So there's a lot of composite here. So in fact, the phase three trial in aging is going to be much cheaper than uh, the same trial for any one of those diseases in isolation. But isn't it's, it also it's, harder it's because you have these confounding factors? Like people like to choose a clean, very clean population to study a drug in. But that's exactly, you know, that really is where people stuck at the end, okay? So le let me say again, for us it's about aging. We are agnostic. We don't know what disease you have and what disease you're going to take. We know that all those diseases, their major risk factor is aging. So we're counting whatever disease you get, you get a point. W this is exactly the point that people are getting stuck, but how, how or, you know, w reviewers told us you're not significant in any one of disease, but imagine that we have 12,000 people in the trial and we're significant for cardiovascular disease. They'll stop the trial because they cannot let the other people on placebo go without and will never prove to them that aging can be targeted. Joanna, it's, you know, I go back to what Howard said and it, it's, it's really important because, uh, how to design these studies and the cost involved in the studies but on the bapinuzumab anti-amyloid Alzheimer's drug, which was really the first one to run big randomized phase three trials. It was partnered with Johnson & Johnson and Pfizer and, and Elan, 
and together they all spent about 1.5 billion on just one phase three trial, and it and it failed. And you know the the, the issue with that is, and the chief scientific officer at Elon, Dale Shank, who was one of the leading thought leaders in this area, when do you start that trial? I mean, should people have been taking bapinuzumab when in their 30s to, to maybe prevent the amyloids from ever forming? And, and just the question marks around that, because it goes back to, I, I'm very interested in your, your protocol for your study and, and whether what kind of uh, indication you might get based upon biomarkers, et cetera. It's, it's fascinating to me because I think the challenge around this, once again, I think will be how do you run the study? What's the outcomes? What do the data say? What could you actually get in a label that you can legally market if you're a, if you're a pharmaceutical company? So we're targeting the biology of aging to improve the function of an aging organ system and prevent disease at RestroBio, and this gets to your point, how do you design that trial without making it hugely expensive? It turns out, how many people during, win during the winter in this room get uh, some sort of cold or flu during the winter? Almost all of us get colds and flu. This happens so frequently that to prevent, they have enough events that it's very easy to prevent these and do a prevention trial. And this is something the FDA has agreed to. We have endpoints agreed on, and it would be the first drug targeting the biology of aging to prevent an aging-related disease, because it turns out respiratory tract infections get worse and worse and worse as you get older, and will lead more and more cause hospitalization and death. So I don't think, again, this is so impossible or expensive, and TAME is a different way of doing it. You know, we just wanted to find an endpoint that we can measure without a huge trial and get, you know, a label. But as, but as was said, um, as Chris said, the indication would be for the treatment of respiratory disease. It wouldn't be an indication no. for the treatment of aging. It would be to prevent, to no prevent, treatment. Put no. To prevent a respiratory disease. So it would be to improve immune function to prevent respiratory tract exactly. infections. Exactly, but it wouldn't be a global indication yes, right. to prevent right. aging. Yes, yeah, yes, yes. yes. Like that's, yeah, that's, right. that, that's the thing. But would it be de facto? The, the, I mean, the label well, could, would say one thing, well, but would we have well, I, journal I, I, articles saying, but they, off they, label, it's all they, the other thing. No, they can't do that. <laughs> right, so we wouldn't want any off label no. promotion, but it's just the first step of breaking it into right. doable right. chunks. Well, you so start with so one start organ system. And then you look at where else. Exactly. So that you, it's you a little bit of a misnomer. The whole aging, everybody, you know, the fountain of youth that you're going to live to 100 and you're going to have, a, as opposed to what you're saying, is exactly that's the right way to approach it, right, is to help. Like disease yeah. by disease. Yes. And or organ system measure. by okay. organ, system. Yeah. organ system. Which is just a different approach than near. Okay. Um, before I turn to the audience for questions, I mean, there's, you know, we live, you know, it was on, only a few years ago when we thought an 84,000 drug that you took for eight or 12 weeks was an extraordinarily expensive number and how quaint, right? So are we gonna be able to afford this as a society and will poor countries be able to afford it when we have these new approaches to change the biology of aging? Well, will everybody get them? I was in a, I, I was in a Vatican with, they can pray for them. with, <laughs> with, with, with uh, Joe Biden Okay, and, and the Pope. This sounds like <laughs> a really And several good other <laughs> people. I actually asked, when they invited me, I asked, am I the keynote? Do you keynote, like you're in a Saturday Night Live uh, am, I, am, I the, am I the keynote speaker? And they said, no, Joe Biden, the Pope is. But what the, what the Pope wanted, what the Pope wanted is how we can accelerate treatment to everyone. Okay, and so Joe Biden gets up and, say, and talks about cancer and the moonshot and, and how expensive it is and stuff like that. And the Pope gets up and says, I still hope that there'll be one chip pill that will uh, cure all cancers all over the world. And then I get up and I said, well, I don't have a pill that cure cancer, but prevents cancer and all the other diseases <laughs> around the world. And it costs, you know, you can get 600 uh, ta tablets in the United States for $40. There's no cheaper drug than metformin. It's probably going to be the first you know, line when we started it. And then it will be like always, it will be expensive <laughs> and then it will be generic 
And eventually, people can have increased health span all over. Do you agree with it that this is going to be an affordable, or is this going to be an incredible have and have not? Well, you know, um, I think what Nir is saying is a beautiful vision. But I think getting there, um, as we've discussed today, without having indications and outcomes that are measurable um, is, is, is the difficulty. And I also think in, in third world countries, um, the, the most efficient way to increase people's life expectancy at this point is probably more, much more likely to be through public, public health, health than Which to, is our 20th century success yeah. story. Yeah. So I don't know if people know, colds triple your risk of having a heart attack during the period you have a cold. So we've actually done some look studies with the Medicare database seeing how much does it cost when an older person gets a cold compared to an age match control. And it costs the healthcare system a lot because these colds that might not be bad in themselves trigger exacerbations of underlying comorbidities. So it's possible with diseases that are preventing aging related disease, and I'm just focusing on the one that we're fo looking at at the moment, will save the healthcare system money. So you actually could price them and have a cost, cost offset. You know, it's, it's possible by preventing all this very expensive illness. Okay. Let's go to the audience. Where's the, who has the mic? Back, back there. Um, please identify yourself and please ask a question, not give a speech or else we're never going to let you have any of these drugs. <laughs> so, <coughs> Sami Inkinen, co-founder and CEO of Verta Health. We reverse type 2 diabetes. Question about Pope and Biden. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Did it make you laugh? Uh, question about inflammation. I think it was um, Dr. Philip mentioned that inflammation is either key contributor or key factor behind aging and um, Alzheimer's. Um, as a side effect of what we've done or side benefit is that we've seen massive reduction in inflammation, C-reactive protein and white blood cell count using nutritional treatment. So I'm curious, could you talk about nutrition a little bit? as a tool for living longer, especially if inflammation is one of the key factors that we should be concerned about. L living healthier. Can we talk about living healthier? You, you can talk about anything. Part? You met Biden and Pope, so whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we're in Washington, and you know Trump is a stable genius, so, you know, the politics goes everywhere. Um, but, but, um, but, but the right quote was a very stable but, genius. Right? Very stable <laughs> I said it at the NIH one day, and it was uh, so. Uh, so anyhow, um, we have to know that exercise is number one intervention for aging at any any sex, any any stage, anything. In uh, exercise is uh, second. As far as nutrition, the what we believe in, and it's a longer story, so I'm not going to say, it's in intermittent fasting. If you can, it's like, it's actually kind of the emptor. If you can fast, if you can skip breakfast and really fast until, you know, one, two in the afternoon, that's the best intervention from an aging perspective. It's not that there are no other health foods and stuff like that. So those are, there's no doubt for that. But my, my view of, of thing is, as you understood, I, I, you know, maximal lifespan Potential lifespan is 115. We argue about that. And I have a lot of 100 years old, okay? We die before the age of 80, okay? I, don't th I think all the interventions that we're talking about can take us above the age of 80, but I think if we want to realize health span, we need to do more. Also, con we have to have appeal. Also, considering the fact, look, it's not about aging. People who are cancer survivors are aging rapidly because of the radiation and chemotherapy. People with HIV get diseases 10 years earlier than other people. People with disability, because they cannot move and then they eat also, they're aging very rapidly. Severe mental illness gets overlooked, but same thing. Um, well, you know, as far as uh, diet specifically, there's, there's been a, a a number of prevention randomized trials of, of lifestyle interventions for Alzheimer's disease, and a major part of those is basically the Mediterranean diet. Um, and there's been some recent uh, 
in-depth analyses of what portions of the diet actually might contribute to the preventative effects of the diet. It repeatedly turns out to be kind of not just fasting, which is a separate issue, I think, but, um, but it seems to be the most important component of the diet is, is fruit and vegetables and, you know, not eating processed food and all that. But from a healthy diet point of view, it seems to be the fruit and vegetables. And the way I think about it is that over the period of evolution, you know, billions of years, hundreds of millions of years of life on Earth, plants live under the sun. And Mother Nature is the, is the best chemist, you know, who ever lived. And, and so plants have to develop really good antioxidants to live under the sun 24-7. And that's why, you know, blueberries and these dark plants have tremendous antioxidant properties. And ant oxidation plays an important role in inflammation and in, in, uh, in, in pathology. So, you know, a, a, an answer to your question would be, yes, I think healthy diet is really important along with exercise. And if you ask me what portion of the diet, the one that makes most sense to me, and which I think has been proven out is, you know, plant-based diet, but particularly these fruit and vegetables that are high in polyphenols because they're antioxidants. And we have systems in our bodies, every cell in our body has an antioxidant uh, processing biology, but it fails and gets overwhelmed with aging. And so that's why, you know, that's kind of the way I think about it. So we all should have listened to our grandmothers. Yes. Uh, Grandma was always right. Another, another question right here. Hey, um, I'm Aditi Ramdurai from McKinsey and Company. Um, would love to know, um, you talked about compression of morbidity and health spans. If people did live up to 115 and were healthy and then died because they came under a bus, what would society be like in 2040? Would love to hear from all of you and, you know, what you think this future could be like if if that was the case? You know, that, that's a great question. We always get it. And you, you, you have to understand, this is not happening in one day, right? We don't go from 80 to 100, certainly not for metformin. Metformin is two or three years, OK? The economist actually is going, the next three years, you're going to get from the economist the answer, because I'm on the board of them, and, and they're doing this paper. But there has to be society changes, and they're not so simple. Retirement age. Pension, you know, like, okay, people who are retired 61 get pension, but people who work at 70, why should they get their pension? But why shouldn't they get their pension? There's lots of, uh, of other issues, um, and there are lots of starting to implement those issues. So, for example, there's a great video that my niece sent me that's called 80 to 4, and that is getting a kindergarten within, within an old age home and getting the children, and not their grandparents, but other grandparents, to be involved with them. It's just fantastic how it positively influenced the kids and the grandparents. So the idea that people could have other interests, first of all, they don't retire, they can have other jobs and have other interests, is something that will need to happen with extensions of health span that's not going to take to be in a day. Other thoughts on? Yeah, I agree. I agree with Nurse. Um, I think grandparenting is, is, you know, especially now with you know women in the workforce. Most women in the workforce, um, you know, my my grandchild lives in Miami, and my daughter doesn't have the advantage of all well, her her in-laws have, but um, but my assistant lives next door to her grandchildren, and um, she's able to play a critical role in their lives, and and allows her grand her daughter-in-law to, to work. Um, so I think grandparenting is really important, the wisdom and the experience of grandparents on younger generations. But also productivity is a complete issue that, you know, we've been talking about for decades. You know, how, how can we employ the wisdom and the knowledge and the experience of older people in the workforce and keep them productive? Um, you know, I think that's, that's, that's really critically important. Um, it's not that older people are taking jobs from younger people, it's how we can use both generations to uh, enhance productivity. John, do you want to? Yeah, I guess I'd, what my hope would be, I've seen my elderly parents age one well and one very badly, and it was painful to see, you know, going on for many years in life with a lot of morbidity. So what I would hope is that this will result in a much better quality of life for all of us as we get older, and again, to everybody's point, not that we live to 140 or 150, but we don't have these decades of poor quality of life and real suffering that I think is kind of 
the norm for a lot of older people right now. One more question, and it's got to be a quick one. We're running out right here. Hi, I'm Sarah Locke from ARP. I was wondering if you could tell us about the reports that metformin has been found to mute the benefits of exercise and uh -huh. speak about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually, uh, I'm submitting a paper of the same study. So f first of all, let, let's uh, understand it. When you, you give metformin with and without exercise, the exercise, oh, sorry, if you give exercise with and without metformin, I want to say, you're going to benefit. Okay, the effect of exercise is great. But your muscle size with, uh, with metformin is not as big as it is after exercise. But then we looked at, we took the muscle biopsies and looked at what happened. And what happens is that uh, exercise, uh, in, exercise does some bad things. Like it increases oxidative uh, damage and it increases inflammation on a time course. And metformin prevents that. But the most interesting thing that wasn't in this paper that you're quoting is the force of the muscle was the same. Okay, if the force of the muscle was the same, but the, f the muscle was smaller, it means that the muscle on metformin performed much better. Okay, and so this is something that will be added. So, by the way, I take metformin and I exercise, okay? <laughs> Just that you know. Anyone else want to comment on that? Okay. Okay, so we are at the end. Um, I, do, I, this, I learned a lot from both our preparatory call and this conversation. And it is, it's very, very provocative. You didn't even have to try. It came naturally. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and and um, so thank you all for attending. And.